What's going on everybody? It's Mr. Gustin. I'm not in the physics classroom. I'm actually in the conference room next to the physics classroom. So uh, that's where I'm at. I found some space to do a little review video for us. So we're going to do that up here. Okay. So uh, I want to start our momentum review by reminding us where we've been, like I always do, and some of the themes of this course that we talk about. So the primary theme of this course is that outside forces change everything. And we'll see that theme pop up kind of routinely here as we go through momentum. Let's think about some examples of how outside forces change things. Well, the first kind of force that we talked about was the uh, net force. The net force causes an acceleration. The net force alone produces an acceleration, which is a, uh, a change in velocity. So what is that? That outside force changes uh, velocity. Okay, that's what, that's what it does. The other kind of net force we talked about, F net, uh, over a distance, that's known as work. Work is a change in energy, okay? These are two primary examples of how forces change something. Now, we can say that a force net causes an acceleration. We can actually also say that uh, an outside force causes a uh, centripetal acceleration, which is a change in velocity technically, but really when we're talking about a centripetal force, that's a change in direction. And so this unit, momentum, talks about another outside force or another way outside forces might produce a change. Okay, so where did we start? Well, we finished last unit with conservation of energy and how we said energy is conserved unless there's an outside force. What we kind of neglected to tell you was that like um, mechanical energy can still be lost even though there may not be an outside force. So here's where we started. We started with this problem. We had two matchbox cars, one at the bottom of the ramp, one at the top of the ramp. They slid down, they collided, they stuck together, then they left this ramp and they landed on the ground. And I said, you know what folks, challenge problem to start second semester, tell me where it lands. And you went ahead and you used conservation of energy and you said, well this is UG of here, that equals K down here. When it turns and, and collides, now it's K again over here, but it's K with like heavier mass, so the velocity is going to go down, and we predicted where it would land on the ground here. We did it in class, we went down, frictionless incline, lands, we're like, yes, got it, we measure, it lands somewhere around here. We were like 80% off, what the heck happened? Where did all this energy go? Like, okay, friction's a thing, maybe, air resistance's a thing, maybe, but like 80% of the energy went to friction? No, no, apparently, in collisions, this is kind of the first big idea, collisions see a loss of mechanical energy. Either I proved it to you or if you're in a different class, your teacher proved it to you by taking two steel ball bearings, slamming them together with a piece of paper in between, and we watch that paper start to catch on fire. So collisions, we hear collisions, and collisions produce heat energy. So no, mechanical energy is not conserved in collisions. I can't rely on conservation of energy when things are colliding. So um, instead, what we need to look at is this new principle of, of, uh, of momentum, okay? And, and that's where we kind of started, was this is a new thing. We have to analyze momentum, and so... Um, and so that's what we did. We started by looking at a different collision that we're familiar with. We started by looking at the bug and car collision. And this is a collision that we talked about uh, way back in unit two, right? If we think about the bug and car collision, when the bug in fact collides with the car, there is a force applied on the bug, right? Force on bug by car. There's also a force applied uh, on the car by the bug. And what Newton's third law says is that those forces are in fact equal but in opposite directions, okay? So the bug and the car, even though the car is much, 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 much larger and the bug goes flat on the window, they still experience the same force. We're going to kind of explain where our thought behind like, well, the bug goes splat, shouldn't it feel a higher force? We're going to explain that kind of thinking where it comes from. So here's basically where it comes from, all right? The car and bug both have momentum. The bug uh, has a very small mass. Uh, the bug will say its mass is little. Teeny tiny little m. We'll say that the car has a really big mass. Right? They experience, they experience the same force. 
The force felt is force. Okay. Well, because they experience the same force, and because the bug's mass is so small, the bug is going to experience a much, much, much larger change in velocity while the car experiences a much, much, much smaller change in velocity. And this idea, this change in velocity as a result of an outside force is not new to us because we said that velocity changes when there's an outside force. This is Newton's second law. Newton's second law says this, F net equals mass times acceleration. We can replace acceleration with its definition, change in velocity over time. When we do that, we get this, F net equals mass, change in velocity over time. We do some fancy algebra, F net times time equals mass times change in velocity. This right here is another iteration of Newton's second law, and it is in fact what we call the impulse, impulse momentum theorem. Impulse is this side of my equation. If I ask you to calculate impulse, what I'm saying is like force times time, right? The outside force on something is an impulse, okay? This over here is my change in momentum. Momentum is defined on our equation sheet. Momentum is mass times velocity is a vector because there's velocity in there. This is momentum, but change in momentum or impulse, also a vector, is change in mass and velocity, or it's F net times time. We have something else to add. The net force over a time is known as an impulse. I'm gonna write the word because impulse's variable is a J, and that's weird. Impulse, which is a change in momentum. They are synonyms. This outside force now can change a new quantity for us and it changes momentum. So changes in momentum look different, right? The bug's change in momentum looks different than the car's change in momentum. But if I kind of look at their things, right? If I go back to the bug and car example, and I think about all four of those variables, mass, change in velocity, force, time, and then I think about the impulse. Let's think, the bug, small mass, the car, big mass. The change in velocity of the bug, very, very large. The change in velocity for the car, very, very small. It would be crazy to think that a bug hits a windshield and the car has a major change in velocity. If it did, that bug might be a pterodactyl and you might be lost like, in uh, like Jurassic Park or something like that, right? That would be insane. So we don't notice that, right? Like if a bug hits our windshield, we don't notice the change of speed because how big our car is or how massive our car is, okay? So bug, little mass, giant change in velocity when they collide. Car, giant mass, itty bitty change in velocity when they collide. We know that they feel the same force. Newton's third law, we kind of have talked about this before. They feel the same force. Well, this time variable is a weird one, right? This time variable, let's bring it down here. This time in the uh, impulse momentum theorem is talking about the time of the collision. Well, time is a weird thing when I have two objects colliding because can my left hand hit my right hand for longer? Like, can I, I can't, they're gonna maintain contact for the same amount of time when they collide. So this is also going to be the same when two objects collide. All right, hear me out. Momentum, or impulse, is equal to force times time. Well, they have the same force, they have the same time. These things have the same impulse. They experience the same change in momentum. They experience the same change in mass times velocity. The difference is that something with a much, much, much larger mass is going to experience a much, much, much smaller change in velocity. That's the case of the car. But the case of the bug, a uh, much, much, much smaller mass experiences a much, much, much larger change in velocity. And that's the case of the bug. So 
impulses, while they might be the same value, can look very, very different to us in, uh, in front of our eyes. Enter our egg drop lab. The first lab that we took uh, care of in this unit was the egg drop lab, okay? And so we have our control group. We got an egg. Here's the ground. That egg is going to hit the ground. When that egg hits the ground, its final velocity is zero meters per second. When it hits the ground, boom, final speed, it comes to rest. What we have to think about is what are the velocities that it hits the ground with, right? If it's going to hit the ground, um, it's going to have an initial velocity of something minus the final, or final velocity of zero. So that difference is going to matter to us. Let's assume, for the sake of this, that all designs that we built have the same mass. Just for the sake of argument, okay? So our first design is here. This thing is going to fall, and it's going to hit the ground, and our initial velocity will say is equal to v. It's initial velocity because there's nothing stopping it or protecting it. It's going to hit the ground with a uh, velocity of v. Some of you got a little wild, and you said, let's go ahead and let's build a structure around this. So you got some foam, some paper, we'll like build some tubes, like this is my structure. Okay, well does that structure slow down the object? Mm, no, its initial velocity downward is still v. It's going to hit the ground with the same speed as the naked egg. Okay, like we didn't slow anything down. That's what we changed there. Some of you, instead of putting padding around it, said, you know what? I'm building a parachute. I'm going to slow this thing down. So the speed at which the egg hits the ground with, uh, the initial velocity here, is much, much, much smaller than the initial velocity over here. Okay, so which of these is going to have a, a greater impulse? Um, let's see, the mass of the egg here is, is mass times initial velocity. The mass over here is the same mass times initial velocity. Well, apparently, case one, we can call this case one, we can call this case two, we can call this case three. Case one and two have the same impulse. They've got the same initial momentum. They have the same final momentum because they come at the same speed. These two have the same momentum. Hmm, I'm pretty sure this egg is going to crack. I'm pretty sure this egg's not. I wonder why. If they have the same change in momentum, well, what changes? I'll tell you. This over here, we know that change in momentum is also equal to F net times time. Well, in this example, uh, the egg hits the ground and the collision happens for a very brief second, just for the amount of time it takes for the egg to hit the ground. With the second example, I have all of this padding. All of this padding means that the first bit of padding to hit the surface begins the time of the collision. It begins the opportunity for the egg to bring its speed to zero. So as this happens, this cushion compresses, and I am lengthening the amount of time this collision happens for. Again, they have the same impulse. There's no difference in their change in velocity. But that change in velocity happens over a much, much, much larger time. And therefore, the force required to bring that egg to a stop is much, 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 much smaller. This is the explanation, mathematically and verbal, for why this egg might survive. Though it has the same impulse as the naked egg, the padding provides a longer time for the collision to happen, therefore decreasing the force required. If I look over here at the parachute, it's a different explanation. They don't have the same impulse. They don't have the same change in velocity. The collision with the parachute happens um, at a much lower speed. The parachute slows it down. It does not hit the ground with the same speed that the naked egg does or that the egg with the cushion does. It hits the ground with a much lower speed. Therefore, they have different impulses. You've lowered the impulse, therefore you've lowered the force required. It has nothing to do with time in terms of the collision. Because quite honestly, the time of the collision is going to be the same as the naked egg. All this is, um, 
based on is the speed of the egg as it hits the ground, okay? So these are kind of the three different scenarios you could have worked through, uh, three different explanations. Obviously, the best option for protecting your egg would be to build some kind of padding around the egg and having a parachute that works. That will lower my speed, which lowers my impulse, and also it will increase the time that the force is applied to the egg, therefore lowering the force uh, on the egg itself. One kind of follow-up that we had to this was uh, graphing a force first time graph. Like if we were to graph all three of these things, we might say that the naked egg experiences a force that high for that long. Okay? And the force changes as it collides to the ground and it collides over a very, very short time period. The second option, option two, we'll say this is graph number one. The second option has the same impulse, the same mass change in velocity, but it experiences a much, much, much smaller force over a larger time, which means that my peak needs to be lower and it needs to be wider because the collision happens over a much longer time, okay? What's interesting about peak one and peak two or graph one and graph two is that the area of these graphs Area one is equal to the area of graph two. But what is the area of, uh, of these graphs? What, is, what does it mean? Well, it would be force times time. So like force one times time. In this case, it'd be one half. But force and time equals force two times. Oh, wait. Force and time. Isn't that impulse? It is. The area of this graph is impulse. So for egg one and egg two, I would have equal areas. For egg number three, I would need to have a smaller area. Well, there's a smaller force. Again, a pretty uh, similar collision time to egg number one because it's just the naked egg hitting the ground, but the force required is much larger. That is collision number three. So FT graphs, the area is impulse. Those are the three graphs that you might have sketched or should probably have sketched for your uh, egg drop lab. All right? So impulse can look different. We've seen the bug. We've seen the car. Let's go back to two objects now because we started the unit talking about two objects. The two objects colliding on the ramp. Where did they land? Is an energy conserved? We did a simulation. So there was a cyan block or a marble and a magenta marble. And they started like this. Cyan marble was moving to the right towards a magenta marble. We saw three things happen. We set uh, the simulation at one point to 100% elastic. This meant that the cyan marble and the magenta marble bounced off one another. They had a change in direction. We came up with this equation. Mass cyan, velocity cyan equals to the negative mass of cyan, velocity cyan plus mass magenta, velocity magenta. What does the negative mean? The negative means we saw a change in direction. It came in, it was moving to the right, bounced off, now it's going to the left. 100% elastic means things bounce off. And the idea behind 100% elastic means that the uh, kinetic energy is conserved. This is rare because we know that collisions sound uh, like collisions. We know that energy, those collision sounds also produce heat. So this is quite rare. It happens with magnets, happens at very low temperatures, with superconductors, these kind of things, but it doesn't generally happen when you hear the collision. We'd have to calculate this to see if kinetic energy is conserved to see if something is elastic. On the other end of the spectrum, we had 100% uh, inelastic. And this was when we had uh, the marble, the cyan marble, moving towards the magenta marble. And after, they stuck together and moved together. They stuck and stayed stuck. This is called an inelastic, or 100% inelastic collision, where the masses of the cyan and magenta are added together. When they stick and stay stuck, we have the final velocity. And then anything else in the middle can be somewhat bouncy, can be somewhat sticky. It's anything in the middle. 
we have an equation that looks like this. Mass of cyan, velocity of cyan, um, initial momentum is equal to the mass of the magenta times the velocity of the magenta times the mass of the cyan, velocity of the cyan. This is anywhere in the middle on that spectrum. We can use that type of equation. The key is energy is conserved over here and kinetic energy um, is not conserved over here. But again, we'd have to calculate that to prove it is elastic or inelastic. Okay? Once we had discovered these types of collisions, we went ahead and examined a couple of labs. We examined our movie myth lab, and we examined our elastic lab. The movie myth lab was an example. of an inelastic collision. We had the initial momentum stored in the dart. The final momentum was after the dart stuck to the object, somewhere over here, something like this. And our job was to prove that the initial momentum was equal to the final momentum in this perfectly inelastic collision. So we got stuck and we said, well, the mass of the dart and the velocity from a photo gate will tell me the initial momentum. This will tell me the uh, mass, the final momentum, right? Which is mass of dart plus the board times final velocity. Okay, I, I can find the mass of the dart. Okay, I can find the velocity in a photo gate. Uh, I can find the mass of the dart. I know the mass of the board. I can find the mass of the board. But there's no photo gate over here that I can use to find the final velocity. So how do I prove that mass, uh, I'm sorry, momentum is conserved? Well, this is where we decided to start using our kinematic skills again. And we said, oh, wait, how do I find this? Like, what? The answer is kinematics. In our case, bottom problem. Okay, and so we had to remind ourselves, oh yeah, uh, in the y direction, when something is launched horizontally, change in y is one half gt squared, uh, and when things move horizontally without a net force, that's like vx times t, and don't forget that time in the y direction and time in the x direction are the same because x and y directions, they move simultaneously, which means same time, but independently, meaning they can move freely from each other. So this was kind of the, the basics of kinematics and horizontal launch problems or bomber problems that we needed to remember so that we could go ahead and find the speed as the board left the table to go ahead and prove that momentum was in fact conserved. Okay, this was a kind of reminding us, hey, momentum is conserved, don't forget that, but also we need to remember we can use other tools in our physics toolbox to determine conservation of momentum or learn more about collision uh, mechanics before and after the collision. So this was an example of an inelastic collision. The next lab we did was the pendulum lab. I'm gonna skip that. I don't really need, don't wanna think it's important to discuss as a review to this unit. Uh, but the other type of collision lab we had was the elastic lab. And this was an example where I had a, a marble down here. I had a larger marble up here. They collided, but they bounced off of each other. And I wanted to determine the elasticity. Was this elastic uh, and how elastic was it? Change in X of A. This here was change in X of B. This is change in Y. But the problem was, in this case, I had no photo gate. So what's a young physicist to do without a photo gate? How can I solve this problem? It's a curved ramp. I can't use like acceleration. So we had to think up something new. And instead of kinematics to start this problem, we had to use energy. 
where UGA at the beginning was equal to the kinetic energy of A down here at the bottom. Where this kinetic energy gave us the initial velocity of A before the collision. This helped us set up the equation. Uh, mass of A, V of A before the collision is equal to the mass of A, V of A, plus mass of B, V of B after the collision. Energy helped us find this velocity. But again, trying to figure out the elasticity of this collision, well, I need to find the velocity of A and the velocity of B after. So what we did is that we measured the change in X at A the change in x of b. We knew how high those marbles fell, or fell. And then again, what did we do? Kinematics. We used Bauman problems again to help us figure out the speed of the marbles after the collision. So don't feel like you need photo gates. Don't feel like you need some kind of speed determining mechanism. We can use our kinematics. We can use our energy equations. We can use those principles, those tools in our toolbox to help us figure out problems about momentum. I don't want to go through the graphs. I really don't uh, because I feel like I've already talked about the force and time graph, but I do want to leave you with one note on graphing. Let's think about this because students oftentimes ask me, Mr. Gustin, what the heck, I'm confused. How do I graph momentum? Let me remind you. Momentum is equal to mass times velocity. If you're asked to graph momentum in time, let me ask you this. How often have you seen mass change or mass do something in a physics problem? How often has the mass of one object not been the same at the beginning of a problem and at the end of the problem? And the answer is not usually. Sometimes if there's a collision problem, I'm sorry, if there's an explosion problem where I have one giant mass moving along and it explodes and the mass gets cut in half or a third or gets, is, is less, yes, the mass of the system changes, the mass of an object changes. But generally speaking, like so far this unit, generally speaking, mass doesn't do a whole lot. So when I'm graphing momentum, I'm really graphing velocity. Now the values are different, uh, velocity has a different value than momentum, but generally speaking, the shape of the momentum graph and the shape of the velocity graph are identical. Generally speaking, if you get stuck, I would think to myself, hmm, what's velocity doing here? My guess is that momentum is doing something very, very similar, okay? Um, other than that, other than that, we now can remember. We now have these uh, a solution to the original problem, right? Other than graphing, right? We can go back in the elastic lab. We can go back to our very, very first lab here, and we can actually solve for this change in x properly now. And we did it in class. There's a solution video also on YouTube. You can go watch that solution video to this problem. It's in my slides. It's in my notes. I challenge you to go back and solve this problem correctly using the information given on that problem. I will leave you with this. We have studied momentum. The reason we studied momentum was because in the collision, mechanical energy is not conserved. It's converted to heat, some kind of thermal energy, sound. We have now studied things that happen as we change heights. We increase speeds. We have now studied things that happen after the collision, kinematics. We've also now studied, because we know momentum, the nanoseconds, the milliseconds uh, during the time a collision is happening. You can now do physics for objects that start at a height, slide down a ramp, whether that ramp has a constant angle or a changing angle with friction or no friction when it collides with an object and launches itself off of a table. You can solve these things uh, using all of the tools from first semester and now this first unit uh, in second semester. I'll leave you with this. I will leave you with this. Do not forget when you're looking at your tests, when you're looking at things from this unit, when you're looking at things from any unit um, in the first five units, remind yourself that outside forces change everything. They change uh, velocity. They change direction. They change energy. And now they also change momentum. Rely on that understanding. Rely on that thinking framework. 
uh, and you will do just fine in your test tomorrow. All right? See ya!